Welcome to section B of uh, core module 1. Uh, the title of our section is Barriers and Enablers of Women's Empowerment. And after going through the text and this video, you would be able to recognize the major barriers and enablers of women's empowerment. So there are different dimensions and issues when we talk about barriers and enablers of women's empowerment. Uh, when we talk about norms and cultures, laws, violence against women, access to public services, or the lack of those, uh, those are the major issues that we can look into. And then, while recognizing the barriers, definitely there are enablers also in place, or there are enablers that we should s strive towards achieving that we need to recognize uh, when we talk about achieving sustainable women's empowerment. So let's um, go through in the next few slides um, the major sectors, development sectors and issues worldwide and see how as uh, collectively as humanity we have achieved so far and what are the challenges that we remain to be solved in order to make sure that we have effective women's empowerment. Um, so the first slide we look into literacy. Uh, as we know, uh, till now, when it comes to adult literacy, uh, since uh, 1990, uh, it has risen to globally 85 percent. So that, that's, a, that's a good start. But at the same time, we know that at present, over 60 percent of the world's illiterate population is represented by women. So that's a pretty sad number, and we seriously need to work um, to solve the problem re regarding literacy. Then let's move related to literacy to education. Uh, one thing that's good is all the developing regions um, have, has actually or have almost um, achieved gender parity when it comes to primary education. But when you move towards uh, secondary and tertiary education, the things are not similar. There are much challenges related to achieving effective gender parity. So we need to definitely work on this. One of the numbers that we have right now is uh, when we talk about Sub-Saharan Africa at the tertiary level of education, only 70 girls are actually in the schools or education system in comparison with the 100 boys. So a lot of room for development. Continuing up to education, there is also a chart that we have used um, at, um, in our and related statistic that we have mentioned in uh, core module one, section B. Um, here you will see that if the girls are poor, then they are less likely to finish their schools, no matter, uh, and more importantly, they're less likely to finish their primary education um, in, in comparison with the boys, uh, no matter where you are. Um, we have uh, looked into the data from India, Niger, Canada, Zambia, Tanzania, and Indonesia. And what we have seen, the girls from uh, the poorest of the poor communities and the vulnerable communities are the worst off when it comes to completion of even primary education. Then um, let's talk about maternal deaths. Um, yes. Um, since uh, uh, in comparison with 1990, there are 45% fewer maternal deaths. Um, we should be able to feel a bit good about this. But we know that 800 women every day die uh, from um, pregnancy-related diseases and um, health conditions. And 99% of these deaths are in the developing countries. So now let's talk about another critical issue, access to clean water. Uh, from 1990 to 2010, uh, 2 billion people uh, can actually have gained access to clean water. That's a significant gain. While saying this, we have also uh, understood that uh, women are the one who are spending a lot of their working hours to make sure that uh, their family have access to clean water. Uh, and they're the one who is actually shouldering the main burden 
of ensuring that access. Um, in one of the statistics that we have uh, mentioned is uh, in the 25 sub-Saharan countries, uh, women are spending 16 million hours per day uh, collectively to uh, make sure that they have access to clean water. So that's a lot of working hour that, that they can, they could have um, actually spent in any, any other work they chose, but they are not doing that. Um, then also the other issue uh, is with uh, pay inequality. It's, a, it's, a, and it's across uh, the different countries, developing and developed country-wise. Um, what, what is a positive thing is 50% of the world's working age women, 15 or over, are actually in the labor force. That's a good thing. But still a lot, of, uh, a, a lot to do because 75% of the working age men are in the workforce. So uh, we need to definitely improve this number as well. And more importantly, globally, women earn 24% less than men. And, and in many cases, what we have seen, women's work, even though they're working as hard as the men, uh, is less recognized and definitely less compensated. In this chart, you will see that we have compared the paid work uh, minutes per day and unpaid work minutes per day. And the black bubbles are uh, men, representing men, and the gray one are women. What you have seen here is the women are actually taking the major work burden, which are unpaid or unrecognized. Um, and we talked uh, uh, in details about this issue in our module, and I would actually request you to go through those uh, um, materials. Now, moving uh, beyond wages and working hours and access to resources, the other major issue uh, when it comes to women's empowerment that actually is being stifled is uh, violence against women. Uh, it's a major problem. Um, of course, um, in 1993, UN General Assembly uh, jointly declared uh, the elimination of violence against women. So there is a policy framework in place. But still, a lot of uh, things need to be done to ensure uh, the safety and security for women, even in their, within their household. Um, because still, uh, what we have seen is one in every three women are actually experiencing uh, physical or sexual violence, and in many cases by their intimate partners. So a lot of thing needs to be done to make sure that um, there are some concrete uh, uh, work uh, is there, framework is there, action plans is there, are, are there, uh, because those things, once we make sure that we can prevent violence against women, that definitely would help us to ensure uh, effective women's empowerment. So if we summarize the key barriers that we have talked about uh, and uh, explained a bit in um, our module, um, we identify that the discriminatory social norms and culture play a huge role uh, when it comes to um, inhibiting uh, women's empowerment. That's, that's number one. And then definitely there are gender bias laws and regulatory environment. We have actually listed a set of laws that is discriminatory towards women in uh, different parts of the world, uh, in the different countries. So I would suggest you, I would request you to have a look into this and then reflect on this. Um, and then definitely limited access to public services um, is, a, is a huge problem. We will. Um, elaborate on um, limited access to public services in uh, the other sections. Uh, but um, this is something, this is not just about financial access. This is citizen services. This is about uh, uh, citizens' rights uh, um, and different uh, rules and regulations uh, that is being um, designed to help women. In many cases, what we have seen is uh, women do not have access to those. Women do not know about those things and there are no proper communication channels to make sure that women can have access to those things and can know about it and do something about it. So that's a huge problem. And then definitely uh, that we just mentioned before that violence against women is a huge problem um, in, in the way to achieve uh, 
effective women's empowerment. So let's actually take a pause and uh, based on our understanding and based on our readings and this conversation, let's um, have uh, some reflection. Let's first see how as a country and as a community we are doing. So I have provided a couple of uh, uh, web links that we need to look into. The first one is um, the UNDP's Human Development Index. So let's first see how we're doing uh, as a community there. And then in uh, then see that what are the things that we can do to improve ourselves. And let's also see year by year basis to see whether we have improved ourselves or we did not, where actually things are worse. And if so, what are the issues that actually is holding us down or actually pushing us forward? That uh, recognition is very, very critical. And then we also need to reflect on which are the sectors? Uh, can we identify which are the sectors where women are actually engaged professionally? Um, and uh, if they are being engaged there, are they facing discrimination or not? Uh, in terms of payment, in terms of promotion, in terms of access to proper um, human resource development trainings and um, related issues. So uh, there is an ILO website what talks about this uh, uh, profession and access to professional integration and discrimination. So let's check where we are, how we are doing. And then let's also talk about whether or not there are laws in place in our own country that discriminate against women or there are laws in place which uh, uh, even though does not discriminate but the, there are social norms um, that discriminate there are social practices that discriminate do we have those let's uh, actually reflect on this let's be honest with ourselves and see how uh, whether or not we have any and if so Let's identify them and work towards uh, uh, actually solving those problems and work towards uh, making sure that those discrimination stops. And only that way, collectively, we would be able to ensure uh, women's empowerment. So in this module, we did talk about major um, key barriers towards achieving women's empowerment. At the same time, we also mentioned in detail about different enabling factors towards achieving women's empowerment. Um, in summary, we think that we need to first engage the other major stakeholders. Uh, we just cannot do it alone. Uh, the society as a whole has to move towards achieving that. And then definitely, there has to be legal reforms and responses. Um, the, the government has to be there. The, there has to be some policy infrastructure. There has to be some legal reforms and uh, uh, legal support structure uh, for scaffolding um, proper uh, women access to legal rights uh, and uh, citizen services. Uh, th those things have to be there. And we also need to make sure that the women's political participation is truly effective and truly democratic. Uh, both offline and online. That has to be ensured uh, from the root level upwards. And then um, education, very, very critical, very, very important. There has to be an improvement in education from primary onwards. Not, And we should not just feel happy uh, with achieving gender parity in primary education and just uh, get stuck there. We need to push towards having effective gender parity um, in uh, tertiary education, in secondary education, and, uh, and onward uh, in, in, in the professional life. And definitely, we also need to make sure that we leverage ICT. We use effectively information and communication technology um, so that um, it's, it can be used as a tool uh, and also as a platform um, so that we have uh, used those technology uh, positively towards achieving women's empowerment. So one such example uh, of uh, including uh, different stakeholders, different elements of the society is this uh, ringing the bell against domestic violence in India. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very exciting and amazing feel-good example where we, what we have seen is the campaign is known as Bell Bajau. Uh, that's the local language. Uh, it means uh, ring the bell. 
Um, and uh, what it does is the Indian men and women, they have been included in the process. Whenever uh, they have seen or observed any kind of domestic violence uh, in, within their community, they started ringing the bell or making sure that the community knows that an, uh, an act of violence is actually taking place. And uh, by doing this, by raising their voice, by raising the alarm, the bell, um, they would prevent it. And also through doing this, it's just not that act of violence. It also raises uh, the awareness uh, against uh, violence uh, against women and also uh, about uh, raise awareness about the different rights um, and the laws that are in place that women should know and should practice and should get help from uh, to protect themselves from such violence. So ringing the bell. Um, against domestic violence in India is a, is a very good case study to look into. And there are several ones, others, uh, that we have mentioned in the modules and I would uh, request you to have a look. Then related to this is definitely legal reforms. So when we talk about legal reforms, uh, uh, legal support structure, that promotes women empowerment. Um, um, it can be in support from the national constitution's point of view, um, it can be from the government regulations and budgetary provisions. We do talk about it uh, in details in our policy modules of Wi-Fi. But uh, engendering uh, our policy is, going, is very, very critical. We seriously need to have um, provisions in place so that we have gender parity uh, in uh, all our policy making process and policy implementation process. And, um, what we have also seen, and we have explained that uh, through uh, several examples uh, in our module, is uh, in order to combat gender-based violence, different countries actually have enacted specialized laws and incorporating different provisions and legal structures. So let's actually look into those. Um, that helps us a lot. Um, that can help us a lot to better understand what are the things we can do uh, from our own community uh, and that can also prompt us to ask what are the laws in place in our own community and if not let's actually work to make sure that there, there are some. And then uh, one of the snippets that uh, I wanted to share from uh, this um, information that we have mentioned in this module is um, a study showed that 38 out of the 100 countries actually analyzed uh, have explicitly criminalized marital rape and sexual assault within marriage. So what we are seeing here is the improvement uh, and the push from the government, from the policymakers, to make sure that there is a legal stand, there is an official uh, stand against uh, violence against women uh, and ensuring a better women's uh, uh, empowerment. Um, beyond this, um, uh, policy reforms and legal processes, um, we cannot press enough on the importance of increasing political participation. That is one of the very important thing. And it can happen both offline in the real world and also online. Now, things have changed a lot uh, uh, for the better. Uh, what we have seen is the number of women in the parliament worldwide has nearly doubled uh, in the last 20 years. But if we see in terms of the parliamentary, uh, parliamentarians worldwide, only 22% are women. But that's the parliament. In addition to this, we also need to focus on at the grassroots level, um, um, at the community development level. Um, and uh, th this is where women's participation also need to be ensured. They need, they need to be there. They need to raise their voice. and. People need to hear them. They should not be sidelined. They should not have just token representation. So these are the critical factors. And in many cases, definitely ICT can help uh, to make sure that uh, women have uh, better political participation. We explained with uh, several examples in the modules. And definitely, I would request you to have a look into this and reflect on those issues. And. Um, when we talk about poli uh, politics and political participation and policy structure, the other important thing is um, increasing roles of women in decision making uh, in the senior management. Right now, 25 women CEOs lead Fortune 500 companies. Um, and um, 
1998 it was just one. But saying that, only 5% of all the CEOs on that five, Fortune 500 list are women. So a long way to go um, before we can actually achieve gender parity in terms of corporate decision making. Um, and we are talking about bigger companies, so definitely um, the same rule should be applying for the smaller ones uh, globally and locally. Now, one of the more important thing that uh, I actually said for the last in this section is uh, education, education for women. And uh, there are several examples that we have given in the module. And what we have seen from different uh, studies, the, for example, an extra year of education increases a girl's income by 10 to 20 percent and is a significant step on the road of breaking the cycle of poverty. Now, that's important. A policymaker should take note on this. The entrepreneur should take note on this. And the family should uh, take a note on this when we are raising girl child in our own family. And when we talk about education, um, in addition to traditional education, we also need to make sure that they have particular support and encouragement um, in order to be educated in science, technology, engineering, and management. Uh, the, the STEM education is very, very important, very, very critical uh, for uh, women empowerment. And what we have seen in both developed and developing countries that women are less represented in STEM field, which need to be changed. Uh, because we know with proper STEM education, uh, definitely they have better chance uh, for, to run their own enterprises, to better chance to have uh, better employment, and uh, the cycle of uh, development actually comes within if we have uh, better education, specifically with the uh, STEM background. So that, that's very important, and I, I would really uh, request you to reflect on this education for women and identify some of the key issues you have within your community when in terms of uh, challenges um, uh, on uh, women education. And then, of course, um, let's also reflect on just not women education, on um, women's political participation and women's uh, participation in uh, different corporate or different workplaces. What is the situation you have in your own community. Let's reflect on this because um, then the materials that we provi we have provided um, in uh, the, this Wi-Fi section will will make sense and will be more uh, and more effective. So, while we do this reflection, uh, let me also summarize uh, some of the key implications of ICT. Uh, so, ICT has a cross-cutting effectiveness. Uh, cross-cutting applications. When we talk about ICT or information and communication technology as an enabler for women's empowerment. Um, um, we did talk about it in section A as well that um, and we have mentioned different examples in section B is uh, uh, in, uh, in our module C1 as well um, that um, ICT helps to create business employment opportunities. It can also help to have better education, women, better literacy for women, uh, better um, education and other um, resources can be available through ICT for marginalized communities um, in different parts of the world. And more importantly, ICT can offer economic opportunity, both as a tool and also as a platform. Um, and while through using this, uh, women definitely um, can make sure that their voices are heard, they are participating equally demo or democratically, and definitely they are creating more economic opportunities for themselves. And if we can achieve those things, definitely um, on that way, we can also ensure uh, effective agency uh, of women um, in every, every sector of our community. So the key messages of this section, if we want to summarize, first of all, women comprise half of the world's population and contribute to the socio-economic, political, and cultural development. Uh, but unfortunately, women are relegated at the site 
they are being discriminated in many different ways and there are so many um, barriers in place um, both from our society's perspective from a state's perspective um, that's there and uh, in order to in order for women to claim their place um, as equal partners for development um, there are certain things we need to ensure in terms of education, in terms of political participation, in terms of legal reforms, and more importantly, in terms of the use of ICT.